When I was a kid, I loved the game of Clue. And my family, my sister and brother and mom and dad, we played Clue. <clears throat> and when uh, Mindy and I had kids, we played Clue with them when they were younger. Uh, and I brought back some of, the, uh, some of the old gang as kind of a reunion. Professor Plum. Mrs. Peacock. Colonel Mustard. And the one that I had a crush on as a little child, maybe seven or eight years old, Miss Scarlet. Now the game was always fun, it was a mystery, and the objective was to try to figure out who done it. Who did the murder, what weapon did they use, and what room did they do, because you wanted to be the first one to know all three. And let's see what we have here. The murder was done by Mr. Green. Now if you look on here, you can see five of the, of the characters, but Mr. Green is missing. Mr. Green did it with the lead pipe. But as you can tell, among all the weapons here, the lead pipe is also missing. And apparently he did it in the library, leaving his glasses behind. Now also, in, um, <clears throat> when I was in grade school, my sister and I started reading the Nancy Drew mysteries, and we loved them. In junior high and high school, my family would watch Perry Mason once a week while we ate dinner. And we loved to watch the brilliance of Raymond Burr as he figured out uh, who the real murderer was, and it was never his client. Somewhere in, in, uh, as a young adult, I, I fell in love with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, oh, look, I have a letter from Sherlock. 221B Baker Street, addressed formally to Mr. and Mrs. Seth Gatchel. Now, <clears throat> full disclosure, even though I love a mystery, love mysteries, there's a difference between loving mysteries and being good at solving mysteries. And so full disclosure, for all the episodes of Perry Mason that I watched and all the, the times of um, reading Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes, I can count to you on one hand the number of times that I actually solved the case. In fact, the opposite was the trend. Um, <clears throat> it seemed to me, watching the show or reading the, the adventure, that there were certain facts that seemed obvious and there was evidence that was damning. And yet, both the, the facts and evidence that, I was, that drew my attention always led me to false assumptions and false conclusions. Instead, it seemed like there was some small insignificant trifle that seemed to be important. A handwritten note, a throwaway line, something in someone's attitude that turned out to be the key to unlock the mystery. Now, life sometimes is a mystery too, and sometimes we are, uh, God seems to be a mystery to us too. And we're doing this series called How Life Feels, and today I'd like to talk about three ways when life seems like that, where God seems to be a mystery and life seems to be a mystery. Uh, the first one is, is God even around? Is he listening? The second, has God abandoned us? Why won't he do something? And the third, is God attacking us? God attacking us? We'll look at these three things. Now, I just finished reading a book uh, by Ken Geyer called The North Face of God that deals with uh, some of these things. It's a, a very insightful book. But I love the subtitle of the book. Hope for the times when God seems indifferent. Hope for the times when God seems indifferent. Now, if you want the sermon in a sentence today, it's simply this. God's ways sometimes seem mysterious, but his purposes are always good. God's ways may seem mysterious, but his purposes are always good. Now, the question to ask is not why is God silent or why has God abandoned us or is God attacking us? 
uh, is God indifferent? The question asked is, then what is God doing during these times of confusion and mystery? And in a nutshell, what he's doing in the life of the psalmist and some of the Old Testament uh, characters that we're going to look at today, uh, he is digging deeper into the hearts of his people. Uh, there's only the top level of our heart, the top half of our heart, we can see very clearly. We can see the desires that we want, and we can see that part of character that, that we sort of like, that, that sort of flatters us, uh, our good intentions. But, but beneath that halfway line in our hearts, uh, what we can't see are the desires for God and the deeper satisfaction for which we hunger and thirst and we can't see the corrupt nature of our heart that is what causes us to, to mess up and to mess up ourselves and to mess up relationships. We can't see these things. And so what happens? How does, how does God reveal these things to us? Through trouble, suffering, mystery. When God seems, uh, is silent, is he around? Uh, has he abandoned us? Or third, <clears throat> Uh, is he attacking us? Let's look at each of these. The silence of God. Uh, one of the uh, characters in the Old Testament that virtually everybody loves is Joseph. Joseph was, Joseph was that annoying little brother uh, that his ten older brothers finally had it up to here with and threw him down a well to leave him for dead. When a passing caravan came by, they pulled him up out of the well and sold him into slavery, and off to Egypt he went. Uh, he became a house servant. Uh, for a man named Potiphar. And even though Joseph was, uh, was an honorable man as a house servant and did a good job for Potiphar, uh, he was falsely accused of sexual assault and rape by Potiphar's wife. Uh, <clears throat> he was immediately thrown into prison unjustly. And for years, he languished in prison, though he tried to faithfully serve God there, but without any idea of why he was there. Why, why would God allow this to happen? He had no idea for a number of years. Uh, silence is one of these things that compels us to struggle with God. Psalm 39, 12, and 13 says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping, for I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were, look away from me that I may rejoice again before I depart and am no more. Now, you see in here this struggle. On one hand, he says he's calling out to God for help. He's calling out to God to listen to him, uh, to his weeping. And then he also says, look away from me. You know, I'm kind of done with you. Uh, if this is how it's going to be, you, uh, you can forget it. Yeah, I'm out of here. The silence of God sometimes throws us into this internal battle, this struggle in our soul with God. We wrestle with God. Um, uh, and, and here's the irony. As we wrestle with God, God draws us to himself in deeper ways. Silence has a way of breaking through the floor of our heart down into the basement to reveal both a, a deeper desire for God and our demand that God do better and give us what we want. Uh, Romans 7, the last half of the chapter, of course, is the, uh, one of the most uh, famous passages that highlights this internal battle. Well, is God around? That's question number one. And question number two gets worse. Has he abandoned us? Abraham shows up on the scene in Genesis 12, and he's given some of the most amazing promises that God ever gave any human being. Your descendants are going to be like the sand of the seashore and like the stars of the heavens. And yet it was decades before he had even one descendant. Uh, by the end of his life, um, Abraham didn't have descendants like these stars of the sky and the sand on the shore. He had a small palm full of uh, grains of sand. There were times along the way where the battle to feel abandoned by God <coughs> raged in Abraham's soul. Sometimes it seems to the psalmist and sometimes to you and I that God has turned away from us, that he has forgotten us, 
uh, that he has abandoned us. And abandonment has um, uh, a really cruel twist to it, is we feel betrayed. Ask any young adult or older adult who when he, was, he or she was a child grew up in a home where mom or dad left the family for somebody else. You understand something of the, the nature of abandonment and betrayal. Psalm 44 continues, Now you gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. This is Psalm 44, 11, and 12. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep. Who would do that? The psalmist says. Now you sold your people for a pittance, gaining nothing for their sale. Where were you? Uh, he continues in verse 17. All this happened to us, though we have not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. To the psalmist, it's inconceivable that God would abandon them because as far as the psalmist could tell, uh, in the top half of his heart, we're doing good. We believe in you and we're for you. We worship you. Of course, what the psalmist could not see is down beneath the first floor of his heart, down into the cellar, the corrupt nature that was being exposed. Our hearts had not turned back, our feet had not strayed from your path, but you crushed us and made us a haunt for jackals and covered us over with deep darkness. Now, one of the things that's obvious in the book of Psalms is that God invites us to share honestly about what's going on in our hearts, even the fury and anger that we have towards God. And again, ironically, even when we feel abandoned by God, if we will honestly deal with God about what's going on in our hearts, it digs deep beneath the first floor down into the cellar of our heart and opens us to a greater hunger to want to know this mysterious God. The first time we deal with mystery, the first one is when, is God around? The second one, has he abandoned us? And the third, is God attacking us? Now, nobody uh, was probably tempted more than Job by this, who in a single day lost all seven of his sons and three of his daughters. He was also a wealthy man, a rancher, and he lost all of his herds and all of his flocks. He also lost uh, health. The only thing that, uh, that was spared him was his wife, um, and that's kind of an iffy deal, uh, which I won't say anything else about. Uh, for the first two chapters of this, Job does pretty well in the midst of suffering, but from Job chapter 3 to 37, he is all over the place. He is questioning, he is angry, he is despondent, he is discouraged, he is depressed, he is furious. Uh, and during the whole ch time of that part of the book of Job, God says nothing. No explanations, no answers, nada. It's not until Job 38 that God begins to speak. But instead of answering Job's questions, God says, I have some questions for you. And when God speaks, it's not anything like what Job wanted to hear and it's not anything that you or I would want to hear. It's almost like nails on a chalkboard. What God is doing through this is digging deeper into the heart of Job, both into deeper desires and the corrupt nature of his heart. Psalm 13 uh, gives an example of this digging down into the heart. Uh, and this is God speaking to the psalmist. Psalm 13, 5 through 8. I cared for you in the desert, in the land of burning heat. He reminds the psalmist that back when my people came out of Egypt, out of the Exodus, I took care of 2 million people for 40 years in desert conditions, feeding and giving them water. He continues, when I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud, and then they forgot me. So I will come upon them like a lion, like a leopard I will lurk by the path. Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. Now sometimes life feels like that. Sometimes it seems like, um, you know, life is hard enough dealing with yourself. 
uh, and, and Satan's temptations and dealing with other people and the, the difficulties of a fallen world. But sometimes it seems like God is, is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with you, uh, like in this case. Now, when did God become a lion to the people? After he had done everything to feed them, to water them, and to protect them. Uh, what was the effect of his blessing to them? Uh, they became satisfied, and then proud, and then they forgot him. Now, God becomes a lion not because his feelings are hurt and because they forgot him. God becomes a lion because the path that they're on is going to be disastrous. It's going to be disastrous on a personal level, a family level, and on a national level. What needs to happen is radical surgery. And he uses the metaphor of a lion coming to tear open uh, uh, people. Um, sometimes uh, in our world, we call this radical heart surgery, open heart surgery. Um, 13 years ago, uh, my oncologist um, did invasive uh, surgery to, to uh, deal with cancer that would have taken my life like it had taken my father's life. My surgeon did everything within her power to kill the cancer that was within me that I could not see and that I barely had symptoms for. This is something of what's going on here. God is not going to let his children wander away aimlessly into destruction without getting in our way and sometimes getting in our way forcefully. Now God uses these three times of mystery. When he, when is God around? Is he silent? Or when it feels like he's abandoned us? And third, when we feel like we're under attack. Now, what I'd like to do is, is to, to dive into a little bit more what I mentioned earlier. What is God doing during these times when it seems like he's a mystery and, God, and life is a mystery? He is engaging in a redemptive struggle down beneath the floor, down into the cellar of our hearts. Psalm 80, verse 4 through 6. O Lord Almighty, how long will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? Not only is God not answering uh, the people's prayers, but what he's aware of, how it seems to him, is God's anger is smoldering against his people. You have fed them with the bread of tears. Not exactly the kind of breakfast you want to wake up to. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. Not exactly a cup of tea. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbors and our enemies mock us. Why have you broken down its wall so that all who pass by pick up its grapes? The metaphor, and probably not even a metaphor in reality, is that the psalmist looks at the walls that have been built around vineyards uh, to protect the vineyards from foxes uh, and from uh, enemies. Uh, and it seemed like that the walls were torn down, not by people, uh, but by God. Why would you allow that to happen? Why would God do that? Now, I've used the metaphor of our hearts being like the, the, the top floor or the first floor of what we can see. And, and what we can't see about our hearts is the basement. Uh, that's a pretty good metaphor. I want you to think about the metaphor of an iceberg. An iceberg, the top, of the, the top half of an iceberg, we can clearly see. And the two things that we can clearly see is we can see our, what, what appear to us to be our most important desires and uh, our good character. That's what we're aware of. As you look at the iceberg, that's what you can see. Our good character, meaning our good intentions, and that we want to do what's right, and we're, we, we, we give olive branches to people uh, who are having difficulty with us, uh, or who are mad at us, or we see our, a kind, the kindnesses that we try to do, or the service that we try to do. We, we see that good character, we, and we see desires that we think are important. Uh, I want to be healthy, and my family to be healthy. I want to have a good marriage, and, and enjoy my kids, and see them grow up to be... Uh, to be good, good adults and, and uh, godly people. Um, we assume that these are the most important desires. But like an iceberg, most of the iceberg is down beneath the water and it's very, very difficult to see 
unless trouble happens. And in this case, what God is trying to, to help us to see is the corrupt character beneath the waterline that messes up a lot of things in our life, including important relationships, and our deeper desires for Him. Uh, the deeper satisfactions that bring the kind of joy we're searching for and all the, these other desires uh, on the top half of the iceberg. Now, I'd like to finish our message here with a metaphor, uh, and the metaphor is a farmer. The farmer um, had finally saved up enough money to buy a farm. And on the day that the mortgage closed, he went out to the fields and watched the, the gently rolling hills, and he was very satisfied that his dream was finally coming true. Uh, spring season was coming, and so he got his tractor out, and he plowed up uh, acres and acres of ground, uh, made beautiful, long, straight furrows. Uh, and, and when planting time came for the seed, he, he planted the seed, he did the appropriate irrigation and fertilizer, <clears throat> and he was a very happy farmer. During the course of the summer, it looked like the crops were doing quite, quite well, uh, that they would be quite fruitful. But then just weeks before the harvest, something terrible had happened to the crops. Uh, they were slowly dying. Uh, what was supposed to be ripening wasn't ripening at all. Um, and he was, he was so discouraged. He was so despondent. You know, God, why won't you do something about this? Why won't you help me? But the heavens were silent. So he went to the experts. He went to, first of all, an entomologist who came out and uh, to see if insects had somehow caused the destruction of his crops. And the entomologist gave him a clean report. Bugs uh, have had nothing to do with this. Then he brought out a, an expert in plant disease. Uh, he was sure that must be the case, but the uh, expert, when he finished his report, said the, the plants are not suffering from disease. Nothing. Nada. Um, it's not until he brought out a soil expert, and the soil expert dug down into the soil beneath what the farmer could see and pulled out samples, and when he came back with his report, it was a terrible report. The soil, completely unbeknownst to the farmer, was contaminated. And to such an extent that no matter how long he tried, the, the ground was never going to produce the kind of fruit or the amount of fruit that the farmer had hoped to have. Uh, it would have to be treated. Well, the, the farmer did the best he could, and he tried to treat the soil year after year uh, with only uh, negligible results. Uh, and his dream of having a productive farm and making a good living at this uh, was slowly declining. Um, he, was, uh, he was angry about this. Um, finally, um, he called out a geologist. The geologist came out, and when he came back with his report, he came back with a very different report. It turns out that deep beneath the farmer's land, there was oil, and a lot of it. Now, for years, he became an instant millionaire. However, he didn't become an instant millionaire then. He had been a millionaire all along without knowing it. Now, in this metaphor, what happened? When the farmer dug down beneath the ground into the soil, he discovered the corrupt nature of the soil that which was contaminated, which he could not see, he was not aware of, but was making a mess with the crops. That needed to be dealt with. But he also saw, through the geologist, is the wonder of the oil that had been underneath his feet this whole time, over many, many years. Now this, this is a metaphor for the mystery of life and the mystery of God. God uses these times when he seems not to be around, when he seems to have abandoned us, or even when he's attacking us, to dig down into our hearts to help us see the corrupt nature, specifics of what it is about our hearts uh, that keep making messes of life, uh, that we are entitled to God by God, and we are um, demanding of people uh, and of God, 
and that we want what we want when we want it. Uh, we are thoroughly, much more thoroughly self-centered than we ever imagined. But also, the, re the redeemed heart of the Christian who has deeper desires, things like, I really want to be a godly man. I want to find my deepest joy in God. I want to experience the love of God for myself, and I want to express that love uh, even through uh, the corrupt nature I still deal with to the people in my life. I long to be an honorable man. I want to be a man of character. I want my life to matter, not in some uh, achievement area, but in the lives of people. This is the mystery of God. And ironically, he allows us to hurl our fury at him in order to make it happen. Well, he hurled his fury at his own son on the cross where he was silent and where he abandoned his son and where metaphorically he allowed an attack to come upon his son for our benefit. This is the wonder of the gospel that he would pursue us corrupt heart and all at any expense to himself that he might bring us to himself. Let's pray together. Maybe this particular message, these particular psalms and stories have stirred up in your heart an amazement about God and God's ways that has humbled you, that has stopped you in your tracks, and where you feel the conviction of sin, of self-centeredness, and of a contempt towards God or towards people. God invites you to just freely acknowledge that. He said, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. And to receive the wonder of the gift that in spite of all of that, he sent his son to die for you and for me. Will you accept his generous offer of forgiveness and yield yourself to him Give him the key to your heart to come in and deal with the corrupt character that still needs to be redone. But also to enjoy the richness of divine desires he places in the redeemed heart. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I really don't know much about this, but I do know I need you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned earlier this book, The North Face of God by Ken Geyer. And I'd like to finish uh, our time here uh, with, with a simple prayer that he writes. Thank you, Lord, that you are not a Mount Everest of indifference. No matter how distant or detached you sometimes seem. We all believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. Help us also to believe in you, even when you are silent. And during those times when you are silent, help us not to be. Help us to sing hallelujah, however cold or broken it may be. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.